Welcome, everybody. I'm Alan Plunkett. I uh, own a company called Phoenix Staff, and, and we've been doing this. This is our third round right now, just trying to help people better prepare for job searches uh, in any way that we can. And today's conversation is going to be about how to prepare uh, for an interview. So, Sean, do you want to introduce yourself? You bet. My name is Sean Plowman. I'm a principal at a company called Booth HR and Recruiting. Like Alan said, this is our third week of uh, banding together as a group. We're enjoying these conversations and uh, we encourage you to ask questions around interviewing today, uh, either through the chat function or however you need to do that. But um, look forward to having a good discussion for the next hour about interviewing. Christian. Um, my name is Christian Kaiser, uh, co-founder of Career Evolutions, and uh, we help as many people we can to go to uh, find work uh, with their job search, with their resumes, with their interviewing. We also help help companies find great talent as well. We've been doing this since 2008, based in Scottsdale, and I'm delighted to be a part of this group. I think combined, we got many many years of experience, and I'm delighted to share everything we can in this hour. And Nick. Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Morrison. I own and run uh, a company called Potiri. And what we're really about is employee engagement. So yes, helping people find work, but really more importantly, find work that's enjoyable, meaning and fulfilling for people. Perfect. So we, uh, we like to start these with a quick poll. And as, uh, as everyone said, we really do want you to ask questions along the way. So just go to either chat or Q&A. Either one will work. So I'm going to share this real quick. Get, everybody get your phones ready because you're going to need to scan something. So just scan that QR code if you could. We'll do a quick poll here. Give everybody another second. All right. So we'll assume everybody's there. First question. What is the adjective that best describes how you feel prior to being interviewed? And this is gonna be a, just a word cloud. So as you <laughs> enter that word, it's gonna pop up. Wow, anxious is getting, getting some play here. <laughs> Anxious, nervous, uncertain, and excited. All right, second question. So anxiety reigns, it seems, in this crew. Next question. Have you conducted more interviews as an employer looking to hire people or as an employee looking to be hired? In other words, are you a manager interviewing or are you a person being interviewed? All right, we'll move on to question three. Have you ever walked out of an interview thinking you nailed it, only to learn that you were declined? It's a fairly common thing. As you will hear from this panel today, I am sure. We as recruiters get a little nervous when somebody calls us and says, I just nailed that interview. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's a, that's a good place for us to start. Let's see, so M Mike, you, you responded uh, through the Q&A that on the first one, inquisitive, which is a great way to be uh, when you're walking in an interview, that is for sure. Part of what we're gonna talk about today is the fact that curiosity is, uh, is a key component for sure to uh, nailing the interview. Let me go ahead and stop sharing this and we will uh, get right to it. So uh, any, of, any of the panelists, please jump in. But when you have somebody who's walking in into, into an interview and uh, they're riddled with anxiety, what are some things that you try to uh, 
redirect their attention to, or what are some things that you use to try to calm them down, so to speak? Uh, and any one of you can start. I'll go ahead and start. You know, I think um, the first thing is, um, the first word that comes to mind is preparation. And we're gonna talk about a lot of different kinds of preparation today, I'm sure, so I won't hit all of them, but preparation in, in all facets. That means um, getting there early. That means doing lots of research about the company to understand who they are, what they do. The more knowledge that you have of the position and of the company, the more comfortable you will be of going into that conversation. Um, so there's lots of preparation. Um, preparation in getting ready early, getting up early. Um, obviously, leaving yourself a lot of time to get there. The last thing you want to do is, is be worried about whether you're going to get there on time, and now you're running in the door one minute until your interview starts, and now you're really in a, in a situation where you're, you're frazzled, if you will. So I, I would say more than anything else, the more preparation in all facets, and we'll talk specifically about those throughout this hour, but the more pre prepared you are, the more calm you will be. For sure. Nick and Christian, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I think like the, the best thing that I found is just to call out your anxiety. If you get into an interview and you're feeling anxious or nervous, the first thing that you should do is call that out with the, the person that you're interviewing with to let them, let them know. And typically what happens is they crack some, you know, a joke and then you all laugh and it's like, it's all good and you move forward. So we actually do, we do a lot of uh, data mining about the hiring process, how people feel about it, how they go through it on both sides. And what we found is that people who are doing the interviewing, not the person being interviewed, the person doing the interviewing is more nervous and less confident about the interview itself than the person on the other side of the table. So most times as a candidate, we walk in thinking they're like, oh, they've got it figured out. They're the expert. We need to fly. It, it's just, it's not true. So just be human, uh, call out your anxiety if you are nervous and it'll be all good. Yeah, these are these are really good points. I, I was I was preparing for today's conversation. I wrote the first thing I wrote was prepare, prepare, prepare. And I think we can all relate to that feeling when we were taking a final in school and we were well prepared and that really tough teacher came and gave us the final and looked us in the eye, so to speak. And we knew we were gonna ace it because we were well prepared and we had studied. That's very different than being out partying all week before the test and not studying and showing up directly from the party to take the test. That panic feeling that we have, knowing we're gonna do poorly, is hard to overcome when you're interviewing. So I agree totally, you gotta to prepare. And then in your preparation, don't forget, you're there also to sell yourself. So sometimes we spend a lot of time researching and we forget that after all, we're the product, so to speak. We're the one that they're looking to hire. So you also have to kind of prepare yourself for how to answer some of the questions that you're gonna be asked. Yeah, and I, and I wanna dig into that a little bit in a second, Christian. I, I would just kind of um, reiterate everything that's already been said. I mean, you know, this is all about how to best prepare for an interview. So obviously we're all gonna say prepare and, uh, and we'll get into the nitty gritty as to what that exactly means so that uh, the listeners, you know, everyone here can, can understand exactly what that looks like. But yeah, to Nick's point, oftentimes the interviewer is as nervous as the person being interviewed. There's, there's so many instances where, you know, I've walked people in for interviews and they just grab somebody off the floor and say, hey, can you come meet this, this person who's interviewing for this job? And they're like, what? I don't, I'm not even prepared. What questions do you want me to ask? <laughs> um, it's, it, you know, they, they could very well be as nervous as you. And, and you know, I like, to, uh, I like to set people up a little bit um, to, to be a little bit less uh, anxious by having them ask the first question. And, and that to me is, is one way to just kind of tip the balance a little bit your way. So what that looks like is when you're sitting, when you're sitting down with someone and, and you're interviewing for a specific job, just say, I understand that this is, you know, this is an interview for XYZ job. I'm really interested in that opportunity and certainly interested in your company. Um, I'm looking for this conversation as, you know, uh, you, and, then, and then just basically follow up with, a, with the first question, you know, as, as, is there anything you know specific 
uh, about the job that, that, you know, intrigues you or interests you or, or that you're excited about. And again, that kind of deflates the balloon a little bit for you and for them because you asked the first question. Um, I don't know. Have you guys done that? Uh, I'm really curious if uh, any of the three of you have also seen that or, or tried that with any of the candidates that you've had to interview. Uh, no, I have not. What I will share is that when I deal with someone who is extremely stressed out about the interview, I, I kind of try to dial it back a little bit and I say, envision having a conversation. You're just having a talk. You're talking to someone about the work that you do so well and what they do well. So it's a conversation. It's a meeting. And if you can establish dialogue instead of just kind of waiting for the next question, so to speak, you, you're just having a conversation and, and, and just visualize that kind of a conversation flow. And I found that when someone gets a little bit too stressed out about the, the, the time prior to an interview, that that is just a good visual. I'm just having a conversation with someone. Um, and oftentimes the person who you meet knows a lot about what you know. So just having to talk about what you already know is really what the conversation is about. Yep. So just setting the framework a little bit differently. Right. No, that's beautiful. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've actually never, never tried that before or recommended it, but I think what that would do is stop the ramble. <laughs> yeah, I think when people get asked the first question, especially when they're really nervous, there's a tendency to like just share the whole life story and just go into everything um, just out of nervousness. So what that might do is just like keep your first conversation short and concise and get the other person talking so you can listen. Just one more thing to add, Alan, regarding kind of the, the first question in the poll. Most of it was around anxiousness and nervousness. It's really important for us to all understand um, it's natural. And that's how we all are. And anything we care about, which we care about getting a job and getting that job, um, we're nervous. And so I, I don't remember if it was Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. One of them said, you know, they were asked if they get butterflies before their basketball game still. And they said, absolutely for every game still. And if I didn't, I wouldn't compete. So to me, let's just acknowledge it, own it, and that's okay. And over time, you practice more and more, the more you interview, the less nervous you get. But, but the reality is let's own it and use it to our advantage in our interviews. Yeah. So there, there's a question that we have from uh, somebody who, who wanted to re remain anonymous. Uh, but I do want to talk real quick about uh, something, Christian, I, I believe, Christian, you brought up, which is um, well, I'm trying to remember exactly how you phrased it, but, uh, I think it had something to do with, uh, re was it read the room that you said or, or something about, uh, just, God, I'm trying to remember exactly how you said it. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I, um, I, you know, I, I don't remember what I said. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's get, let's get to this question then first. Um, it, it'll come back to me. Um, <laughs> okay. But this person just asked, I have a diverse background in a few areas. Sometimes I think that comes across as not sure what I want to do when I grow up or a generalist rather than a specialist. Any recommendations on how to navigate that? Uh, I think we've all experienced that. So uh, just, just jump in, Christian or Nick or, or Sean, if you'd like to, to start. I'll start. Um, that's a great question and something um, to be concerned about. I think that's, that's legitimate. What I would say is um, the more you understand the role prior to the interview, the more research you've done, whether it started in a phone screen and now you're going to an in-person interview, the more you can uncover about the exact role, then you can take your background that does fit that job and you can focus in those areas going into that interview. Uh, and so a lot of times the, the process in interviewing, a lot of times is a, is a phone interview that's more personality and cultural fit and those kinds of things. And then, and then an in-person moves into some real detailed about the job. So take advantage of that first interview to learn the role, but also, and we've talked about this in previous, our previous two sessions, I believe, take advantage of doing research by talking to people either at that company or that have worked there before to understand what that job title means at that company and what that role is. And if you do that, now you can go into your interview with more confidence and take away your generalist and focus on the areas of your, your career that fit that job and focus on those going into it. Again, that's preparation, but you do all of that and it helps in so many ways. 
Yeah, I think that, I think that's a really good point, Sean. And then also, you can use your really broad experience to also show what more you bring to the table. Sometimes employers are willing to kind of ex to widen the job description a little bit. I mean, after all, a job description has some really critical pieces to it, but it also has some desired pieces. But you know, especially in smaller organizations, they're going to be willing to adjust and actually having a general background is oftentimes more valued in smaller organizations than in really giant organizations. So um, the trick is obviously to show how you're gonna overcome some of the things that you may not know and just show in the interview then that your learning curve will be as small as possible through the steps that you'll take to overcome that learning gap. Yeah, yeah I agree, I think that's really great. Um, I, I think the, the, the most important thing to focus on in what really means the most is the future. And so the past is definitely critical and you would have learned a lot and that got you prepared in order to do this. What you want to focus on is why you'd be a great fit for them in the future, like a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. And so focus on that and what maybe the past did in order to get you prepared for the future and why you'd be a right fit there. Because that's where people are really most focused on is how you're going to how you're going to interact with them and how you're going to impact their organization. Right. Yeah. And the only, the only thing I would add to what's already been said uh, is I, I consider that to be somewhat similar to the you're overqualified sort of answer. And the overqualified answer typically comes up when you're not answering a direct question with a direct answer. So if, if the interviewer says, you know, we're looking for someone to come in and solve for X, Y, Z. And you say, well, not only have I solved for X, Y, Z, but in my last company, I did A, B, C, G, and H as well. So how great am I? Um, that's overqualified. That is talking yourself right out of that job. So be, be, be very cautious of understanding that when somebody's interviewing you, uh, there's a good chance that their company size or their project size or whatever it is they're looking for you to do is not to, to the same scale as what you have already done. And therefore, they get scared off by the fact that you're probably going to leave when you find something that's broader or bigger or more challenging than what they have to offer you. So though it's great to say, I have all these other skills mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes it's also a good way to shoot yourself in the foot. So I don't know if that helps uh, in that question specifically, but you know, a generalist rather than a specialist could be you're answering more than what was asked and, and just be very cautious of that. Answer the question as it's asked and then end it with, did I answer your question? And yeah. leave it there. Yeah, Alan, I think that's great. A direct answer to a direct question, I think is a real key takeaway for people. And I would also say be specific in your answer. Um, quantifiable, those kinds of things that are specific to the question answered, and then and then keep it at that. If you go on too long and ramble um, about other things that may have nothing to do with that specific question, you'll be viewed as more of a generalist in that, in that situation. Yeah. Uh, another question from the uh, from the field here: Can you share how to approach first, second, and or third interviews differently? And uh, we all have experienced multitudes of those, so. I think we all have experiences to how to approach those differently. Um, whoever wants to, to start off, please do. I'd be happy to start. Um, obviously, when you have a process and you realize there's more than one interview, you have to look kind of candidly uh, at each step and say, what's the goal uh, with each interview? Um, and of course, objective for interview number one for yourself as a candidate is to get to interview two and so on and so on. Um, usually the team that will be interviewing you and the person who's interviewing you will in fact be identified before. Early on, oftentimes the interview is really about screening to make sure that you are qualified to meet the requirements and that the person feels comfortable handing you off. And then as the process continues, you will in fact be speaking obviously with people who you will be working with as well as your future boss, so to speak. And, and the nature of the questions that change and the dynamics change and how you prepare for each change as well. And finally, your answers will change somewhat. If you get asked the same question by the first person that you meet in round one, that question that is later asked maybe in round four by a future boss 
needs to be answered somewhat differently. I mean, you need to adjust to the audience. Very true. Nick or Sean, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, you know what I encourage people to do is treat them the same. Uh, so where I see a lot of people fall out or where it can be really detrimental is to, because you're going to have multiple different conversations and you are going to be asked the same question multiple times. So where people really fail is like, oh, well, like I told Alan last week in that other conversation, or hey, Christian already filled me in on this topic, so I got it. We're going to like treat it brand new every time. Every time you get asked that question, oh, wow, okay, great question, and then go ahead and ask it. And you can also ask the same question to multiple different people. Because what I encourage both sides of the table to do is to gather as many data points as possible and then look for consistencies and inconsistencies. So, for example, if you, if you interview with seven people in the interview process and you ask all seven of them, what's the mission of the organization, and you get seven wildly different answers, then like, okay, then <laughs> we're, we're all trying to, we're all scattered and going different directions. Maybe there's some sort of an issue there. So, um, I just say treat it, treat it kind of the same as you go forward and look for different data points. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, it's a little bit of a difficult question because different organizations handle their interviewing so differently, right? And, um, but what I would say in general is, is if there's an opportunity prior to the first interview when it's set up, maybe somebody from HR has contacted you to set up an interview for next Tuesday, it's totally appropriate to ask who will be on that interview, what the purpose of that initial interview is. If you're certainly working with a recruiter, by all means, the recruiter should have an idea of what that interview, first interview would be like. Is it more cultural in nature? Is it more technical in nature? So if there's an opportunity for you to ask, then you should definitely um, ask that question to find out what, what to expect in that type of an interview. That's a perfectly okay thing to do, um, particularly if it's a company reaching out as an HR re representative uh, to set that up directly with you. And certainly a good recruiter would understand the process um, having worked with that company for a long period of time. Right. Yeah, and oftentimes, I mean, like, like you said, Sean, uh, every company handles it differently. A lot of times you're moving up the ranks. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you're, you know, the, the first interview is with, you know, people that you might be working alongside or people that are working for you even, whereas uh, the fourth interview or third interview could be with the person that you're directly reporting to. Um, so there's that to consider. But I would say the biggest mistake I've seen people make when they have multiple interviews is when they walk out of the first or second interview and they're like, man, I wish I had answered that question better, that they don't go home and study how to answer that question better the next time they're asked it. Um, and, and that to me is a, is a big, a, a big miss. You know, it's a, it's a, a failure on your part to not really do your research or, or ask people, Hey, I was asked this question. How should I answer it? If I'm ever asked it again, because they, they might. Um, and you need to understand that they're exchanging notes. So when you interview three, four times, chances are pretty good that those notes on the first two interviews are getting entered into some sort of system and people are saying, hey, dig a little deeper in this area or understand a little bit more about this part of this person's background because that's the only part that I didn't really dive into or I didn't really understand deeply enough. Um, so try your best to kind of do a, you know, an analysis on, on how the interview went in areas that you could have done better or wish you had, you know, answered things differently and make sure that you do next time. Uh, next question we just got from Scott. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today, Scott. The next quarter hiring process practice will be different. Supply of qualified applicants is at saturation point. Backup candidates have backups. Candidates are at a definite disadvantage. Differentiation will always be important, but what specifically must a candidate do over the next two quarters to land a job? So yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question, Scott. We, we talked a little bit about that during the differentiation part, but we absolutely have uh, some, some insight for you on, on how to stand out. And, and we're talking about that with people all the time right now, how to, how to separate themselves from the pack, so to speak. So uh, Nick, do you, wanna, do you wanna jump in and, and address that one? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really great question, Scott. What, what I would say to that is that, that fundamentally people hire other people or companies hire people in order to make their lives easier to advance something that they're up to. Um, so they've got like a, they've got a real need. And so fundamentally that's always the same. Just the differences are is that the needs have changed. And so you need to figure out at a more in-depth level what the needs really are, how fast they're changing, where are they going, and then show that you can really deliver on that and that you can also be flexible. Um, because um, I think part of the part of the interview process, a real, a really what we're seeing is the interview process is changing on a day to day basis. And so one week we may be really confident that we can fly people around the country, go and do interviews. The next day it's like, no way that's going to happen. Let's figure out how to do a video interview and test. And then, uh, you know, one day we're really confident that, you know, offices are going to open back up, projects are going to resume, and then you can start. And then the next day it's been kicked out two weeks. And so we're really asking for a lot of flexibility during the process. And that, uh, you know, can sometimes be the differentiator between if you're the right one or not. Um, so I, I think that's, it. And then also, you know, being sure that you can solve long term problems and issues also, you know, don't be short sighted, like there are definitely issues and new issues that are coming up today that you're going to come in and solve. So uh, look for the short term, the impact that you can have today, and then also the impact that you can have long term, because ideally you want to stick around with this organization for a year, five years, 10 years, whatever your horizon is, and we're going to be sort of out of current market conditions and brand new market conditions. So show maybe that you can meet those needs in multiple different cycles. Hey, Scott, that's a, that's a really good point. And to, just to summarize for, for all of us, you, you know, basically what Scott's saying is, hey, there are going to be a lot more candidates looking for jobs over the next couple of quarters. And that hasn't been the case for many, many years. In fact, it, as unemployment got down below 4%, um, in some cases, there might have only been two or three people interviewing for a job total. Now, all of a sudden, there's going to be a glut of candidates out there. So how do you stand out? How do you differentiate yourself? So let, let's just start with the basics. Uh, and I think, you know, this might sound really fundamental. I hope it doesn't for all of you, but surprisingly as recruiters, although this is fundamental, it gets missed over and over and over again. Let's talk about a few of the things that matter. How, when you show up to your interview, how are you dressed? Let's talk about that for just a quick minute. I'm not gonna give tons of advice on that other than to say, be conservative in your dress. And I always say, if you're debating whether to be a little more formal than, than informal, I would say be a little bit more formal. In all cases, that's the case. They will let you know, hey, when you come back next time for your other interview, don't worry about putting a tie on. And by the way, sorry, the light just went off my conference for a second. <laughs> okay, back on. Um, but anyways, um, so, so, so dress, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that, that seems fundamental, but if you want to stand out, you can do that, first of all, in dress. Let's talk about being to your interview early and on time. And when I say early, I'm talking 15 minutes. You are there in the lobby 15 minutes early. That allows you to, to calm down a little bit, allows you to go to the bathroom, um, make sure you know, your shirt's tucked in, do those kinds of, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and then let's talk about the communication side of all of this in person. This is really, really important, right? Eye to eye contact with people, firm handshakes with people, um, goodbye language, sitting up, not sitting back in your chair, those kinds of things. I mean, they, they sound super fundamental, but you'll be surprised out of the 10 people interviewing for that job, five of them, five of them will disqualify themselves <laughs> based upon the way that they communicate with people. So you want to be in the five that communicates in a really engaging way. And then just another thing I would say is listen, listen carefully to the questions being asked and, um, and do not interrupt <clears throat> during that time. So these are just some fundamental things and we'll probably get more into them, I'm sure, but but I thought it would be a good time to, to share that, Scott. Those are ways that may sound really fundamental, but the reality is you'll be surprised. You'll stand out by doing those four or five things compared to most people that are coming to interview for the same job. Yeah, yeah th those were excellent points, Sean. And, and Nick, um, you've said pretty much all the stuff I wanted to say, but I'm, I'll speak to the mindset then. Um, there was a movie many years ago called Highlander where they said there can only be one. So unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you phrase it or view it, there can only be one who they're gonna hire you for the role that you're interviewing for. So recognizing the obvious that when there's more people competing for the jobs, the competition is more fierce, you know, to liking it, you know, peewee football, middle school football, high school, college, and NFL, yes, the competition gets fierce, 
But the, here's the good news. There is no one else out there like yourself. So if you're willing to accept that you're always going to be the best at being you, then be the best you. Don't worry about how many people are competing. I realize it's very daunting when we go on LinkedIn and it says a gazillion people have all applied for this role before you even click apply. But you're you, and you just need to work on being the best you as a candidate and using some of the tips that Sean and Nick and Alan were sharing earlier. Uh, what difference does it make if it's a thousand people or, or two, as long as that one is, that is chosen is you? Yeah, no, that's great. The clan McLeod. I love Highlander. Um, <laughs> the, the only thing I would add to that, uh, folks, is don't apply only to postings. So no recruiter has a lock on all the postings that are available in any given market and, and no company is posting all of their jobs. So when you see a company that you're interested in, when you are interested in just an organization overall, find a person and send your resume or cover letter or an introduction of yourself to that individual versus only applying to jobs where it, where the backups to the backups to the backups of candidates exist are in their database of jobs that have been posted and people have sent the resumes to uh, where you're going to stand out and differentiate. I tell people all the time right now, at least 33 plus percent of what you're doing should be to unposted roles, just companies that you want to submit your resume to go ahead and do that. You know, there are companies in Phoenix right now, which, which is where I reside, um, that pulled all of their postings. I mean, the end of March, early April, they pulled all of their jobs. Does it mean they're not hiring people? Absolutely not. It just means they don't want to get flooded with people. So if your skill set is something that you feel confident would benefit that organization, apply to the organization, not to a job. And that is, that is one key way to, to set yourself apart and stand out from everyone else who's applying just to jobs. And the good news is I've made that point for the last 18 years and very few people take me up on it. And I guarantee <laughs> it's a, it's a good way to, to stand out and separate yourself. So a lot of people don't, aren't going to do it. So you're still going to stand out. All right. Krista Fernandez, uh, fundamentals are important for females is it important for a certain hairstyle. Is it important for a certain hairstyle? Traditionally I've heard women should keep their hair up, but lately it seems as long as you are presentable, it doesn't matter. I, you know, this is my hair. So I'm, I'm, <laughs> a, I'm the last guy uh, anyone wants to take advice from on hair. But uh, I would say I have never, ever, ever uh, thought that that someone needs to keep their hair up or or in any certain way. I mean, presentable to me is is presentable. You know, it's uh, it's combed or it's brushed. Um, you know, I. It, to me that, yeah, to me that, 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 that has never been a stopping point, uh, someone's hair that I recall. Any, anyone else? I, I would agree with you, Alan. I've, I've never heard of a candidate being passed for bear, bad haircuts. Um, although I've been known to wear some crazy hair over the years <laughs> and, and heading to my uh, hairdresser on Thursday. So we'll see what happens. But no, the hair... You know, if, it, if you feel comfortable with the way you wear your hair, that, comfort, that comfort is going to translate to confidence. And you're just going to be not worrying about your hair and you're just going to be you. So, you know, the hairstyle that you want to wear is, is I think, you know, the best approach um, as, as long as it's not quite as crazy as some of the haircuts that I've had over the years. Anything to add, yeah, Sean? I'd say probably, yeah, I'd say probably do if, if you've got, well, that like anything, do a trial run and ask for feedback. So the day before you go in for an interview, uh, have the same background that we, we, you, you would use, maybe even the same clothing, have your hair the same, and then, you know, FaceTime or Zoom your, your mentor or previous colleague that you've worked with and then just ask them for specific feedback. Hey, what do you think of the lighting? What do you think of my hair? Is the shirt okay? Uh, are the books that I've got in the background all right? You know, I mean, just ask for feedback and then uh, people will typically tell you what, what they think. If anything's distracting or it's not going to work, they'll let you know. Agreed. 
So uh, I want to throw in this question to the panel as well. Um, I, I know some folks on, on the call right now or on the webinar right now are going through a career transition or they're transitioning from doing one thing to doing something entirely different. And, and those interviews are tough. You know, when you're applying for a job that you've never done before, uh, you get asked questions that you've never been asked before. And how do you best prepare for that? There's, there's one specific example that I'm going to bring up here in a minute uh, with, with one person who I do know is on the webinar, but what is your recommendation? I mean, somebody's going from, let's say they're, you know, recently out of a boot camp uh, for technology, or they've recently taken, you know, several classes in accounting and finance, or just got their marketing degree, but, you know, their entire life up until age 32 was something different than marketing, but now they want to pursue that. What are some things that they can do to best prepare for interviewing for that which they've never done? I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. That's a, that's a common, a common occurrence that's going to be happening over the next few months here, I think, as people look at their careers and decide to make some changes, which is great, I think. Um, and, and it can be scary for people. Uh, here, here's what I would say is the most important thing, is when you have the opportunity to talk to, a, to be interviewed and talk to somebody about an opportunity, you need to be able to share with them and show them examples of how quickly you pick things up. And you need to use specific examples in that. Um, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. I just helped somebody um, land an account manager job for an insurance company, and they are not licensed in the insurance, health insurance industry. Um, but, I, but I really believed in this person based upon the fact that in their previous job at the current company, they had been promoted three times and in some cases had taken upon additional work that they were not trained in and picked it up very quickly. And so that was a sales, a selling point to a, to a client about this candidate, how they're the type of people who can, who can figure things out quickly, will put in the work to do it and enjoy learning new things. So when you have an opportunity to show that in your past, even though it's in a different industry, but you have the, the ability to show them that you can really, really pick things up and that you've continually done that throughout your career and you're and you are excited to do that for them um, it just shows them a history of somebody who against all odds is always getting better and always continually learning in their career that will set you apart from others who are in the same boat that you're in for sure anything else gentlemen yeah i would say to that you know have a dang good reason as to why you know, Christian was talking earlier about the one, you know, there really is likely one that they're going to hire. So, you know, if they're asking, okay, why are you interested or why are you the right fit? And your answer is, well, I'm qualified and I'm available. It's just, it's just not good enough, right? I mean, you and a whole lot of other people are qualified and available also. So just have a deep seated reason of why, like why you're the right fit not only today, but a year, five years down the road. Um, and you really have to own it and believe it. It's not like marketing material, like what's going to look the best or sound the best for, you know, on a billboard, but it's like truly why are you interested and why are you going to be the right fit? That's a really good point. To add to that, one of the things I wanted to share is that um, if you feel that hands-on experience is critical, then try to volunteer your church, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, your HOA, you know, there's always opportunities to volunteer. Also around campuses, schools, there are loose groupings, you know, plank this, plank that, see this, see that, where people are getting together to do some really important work. It's unpaid, but you're getting the hands-on experience. And if you're able to kind of get that uh, on top of the education or your real careering, you can actually show that you have the hands-on experience. Another thing, of course, is to show, again, how to keep that learning gap as minimal as possible and what you will do to you know, accelerate the learning curve. And that can be done successfully in any of you because people re-career every day successfully. It's harder. The further away you get from what you know, the harder it is. You know, so it, and then, of course, there are some positions that perhaps we'll never get. For instance, if we want to be an astronaut for NASA or for Elon Musk, we probably are not going to get the job if we've never done, you know, haven't, you know, haven't completed any sort of training prior, never flown an airplane. 
so the the curve may be too far so you know somewhat strategic of course but just think of it as the center it's like here's where i'm at and how far am i looking to move away from what i already know and there is such a thing as going too far um for instance i'll never play football again i'm too old um but um you know most of us don't want to be professional athletes anymore so yeah, the, the only thing I would add to uh, what's already been said, so that the individual who's on this call right now is making a transition into help desk, and they're in a retail environment right now. So one of the questions that, that came at them uh, during the interview process was, how are you going to handle an irate customer on the phone? You know, in a help desk role, you're going to have irate customers. And his initial thought was, I've never done that. Well, yes, you have. You work in a retail environment right now, there are plenty of people, plenty of times where they got mad because your, your return policy wasn't great, or they got upset that you were out of stock of something, or they were mad that you know one of the other clerks made a recommendation to buy this product, but it was actually this product they should have purchased, and now they have to come back to the store to buy a new one. There's usually things that will relate to what they're asking for. Uh, in your experience, just try to find those commonalities because oftentimes they'll exist they won't always exist, but sometimes they will exist. And you just need to try to find those commonalities. I didn't do exactly that, but I did do this. Mm -hmm. um, so try to find those things that, that, may, uh, that may correlate. Um, and, there, and there's also, you know, as, as uh, hard as it is to imagine, there are very common questions asked in every single interview ever done throughout history. Where do you want to be in five years? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Why do you want this job? You know, what made you apply to our company versus 12 other companies? There are going to be standard questions that are asked of you. So just be prepared for the standard ones and then try your best to prepare for the ones that might be curveballs, uh, of which there typically will be those too. Uh, I want to talk about employment gap, employment gaps for a second, because, you know, we're in it, we're in a time right now where I think we're probably going to see a significant amount of resumes that, that may come our way in the next three, six, nine months that have employment gaps. Um, how do you all advise people answer those? I mean, let's say pre COVID they were unemployed and let's say they were unemployed since December of last year or January of this year. Um, and, and we're now pushing into, you know, five, six months into the year. How do they address those? And what are some of the, some of the, answers that you all have heard that, uh, that really resonate well with you. Christian, we'll start with you. Okay. Welcome the opportunity to speak. You know, you're going to get asked. So when you see, when you see yourself interviewing, you know, you're going to speak to it. Have, have your answer ready. And, and my, my tip is try to be brief and amazing very much like when we as children threw a rock across the pond and it was skimming on the surface <clears throat> if you find yourself explaining why you're not working five minutes later you're sucking the air out of the interview and you will most likely talk yourself out of a job so don't get defensive welcome the opportunity speak to the things that you have done it could be volunteering it could be helping it could be serving um, it could be education it could be training um, so show how you've spent your time uh, within reason, of course. And then as the conversation goes to maybe 45 seconds of speaking, you need to close back to why you're there in the first place. So the bridge is basically, and that's why I'm so happy to be here today to speak about this great opportunity because I think I'm a great fit for the role. Now, they may push back a little bit and ask you follow-up questions, so just be ready. But avoid going into the details that, that will um, cause you to speak to this question for minutes and minutes and minutes. It's, it's an opportunity to shine. Nick, you want to grab it as well? Yeah, I, I, I would just reiterate what Christian said. I mean, stick to the facts when the question is asked. You don't need to write it on your resume of why you may no longer be at that company or why you may be in transition. 
and you don't necessarily need to advertise it, um, just, you know, when it's asked, be prepared to answer it and just answer it with the facts. And so it's less of like the story and the opinion, because um, really what people are looking for is that you're the right fit today and into the future. You know, your past is sort of your past, you, you know, and we take that into consideration. But really what we're looking for when we're hiring is like, hey, can you come in and solve an issue today? And then also, are you going to be a good fit for us moving forward? And so, you know, I do a lot of work with an organization here in Phoenix. It's called St. Joseph the Worker. And uh, greater than 50% of the client base there have got felony convictions. And so we do, you know, we do all the time interacting with folks that have got maybe 10 year gaps, 15 year gaps in their resume for some reasons that are maybe less than beautiful or could be considered that. And, you know, we just hit it straight on. And I know that's an extreme example, but we just hit it straight on. What were the facts, right? So why, uh, you know, why were we unemployed or why is that gap? What were we learning in there? But realistically, here's why I'm the right fit today. And here's why I'm going to be the right fit moving forward. And normally if you just hit that straight on and then always ask like, hey, did that answer your question? Anything else that you would like to know? And you'll be good to go. Yep. Sean, yeah, anything to add? That, no, that's exactly right. My, my first thoughts were just be honest, uh, be sincere and be direct um, in, in the answer. Um, and they'll, and they will, uh, they'll appreciate you um, just being honest. Um, and you don't need to go into the, the big story of, yeah, but I've had 23 interviews so far and, you know, and that whole thing. And you leave that out and you just say, this is what's going on. I was laid off, you know, two months ago. I've been searching, excited about talking to you about this opportunity type of thing. And you leave yeah. it at that. Yeah, I think that the, the big uh, takeaway there is don't get defensive. You know, that it's, uh, it's an immediate turnoff. If, if you're tired of being asked that question, you will be asked that question. You may get tired of being asked that question, but do not get defensive. It's, it's not a good look for anyone. Um, it, th this is another one that, that comes up often. You know, if you, if you left your job, which we all have seen the, you know, the meme a million times, people leave bad leaders. Um, and, and, you know, during the interview, you say, why did you leave that last job? You know, it's uh, it's probably not appropriate to say I was leaving my bad leader. So, what are what are some ways of answering that question? Also, you left your bad job because there was a bad leader, but how do you answer that question uh, delicately without saying it that way? Uh, and I know we've we've talked about that at least in pieces in previous calls, but but how would you guys approach that? I think I think it depends, but I will say this: oftentimes you can you can mention that there's not a culture fit. Yeah, and, and I would avoid going negative on your previous boss because he or she may have to be part of your reference checking. So, uh, and certainly if you're throwing ex-employees and bosses under the bus, it's not really gonna work out for you that well when you're interviewing them. So speaking to, you know, um, that there wasn't a culture fit and then be ready to speak to it without going into negatives, I think it will be one, one of the suggestions that I oftentimes find myself recommending uh, when I'm coaching clients. Anything else to add to that, Sean or Nick? Yeah, maybe I would just say, um, you know, during that conversation, focus on what you did amongst your circumstances or what everybody else was doing. And so what's not a fair answer is that, uh, hey, my, my boss or our owner or CEO was this. So then, you know, I just stopped showing up to work or I stopped doing my job or I only did the bare minimum. That's not acceptable. So show all of the things that you did, even amongst maybe everybody else doing what wasn't right. And then, uh, I don't know, maybe this is just my personality, but I would focus on what you really want next. So maybe like address it, hit the facts of why you didn't want to be there and then focus on what you really want to do next. Right. So what's the right kind of leadership style, how you would think you would interact really well with everybody. And then maybe how you want to be a, who you want to be as a leader also, because that may represent who you'd work well around. Yep. Sean, anything else? No, I think they, I think they've covered it. You know, the, the most important thing is um, they'll come across as um, a whiner and a complainer uh, when you answer that question. I mean, as soon as you do that, um, you put yourself in a position as someone who could be a problem employee in the future. Yeah. And a lot of times you'll turn off uh, the interviewer at that point in time. So be careful. 
uh, about that. I think sometimes, Alan, um, if it's accurate, first of all, you need to be honest, if it's accurate and um, just from a career fulfillment standpoint, that wasn't the right fit for you job-wise or company-wise, you can, you can talk about that career fulfillment and um, what you want to do with your career. It shows that you are proactive. It shows that even though you um, had a job, you were willing to leave a job because you weren't being fulfilled by things and it allows you to explore what fulfill, fulfillment means for you with that interviewer and, and then tailor that towards this job at that company and, and why that would fit well for the two of you, right? So I think there's ways to, to do that uh, by using that uh, particular example. Right. Yeah, and I think the, the, the one answer that I heard that I thought was fairly clever at the time was, let's just say every now and then Glassdoor is correct. And, uh, and that was, that was the way that they answered that. And, and I thought that was pretty clever. And, uh, because it was, it was a difficult company. It was definitely a difficult company to work for. And, um, it was, uh, it was interesting, but so, uh, are there questions that, that, uh, that come up that keep stumping people in an interview? I want you to think about that. So if there are interview questions being asked of you, uh, just post them to the Q and A, and and uh, and the panel will answer them. But the the only other thing that I wanted to to hit on really quickly is getting too comfortable in an interview, because I think that often happens, and especially if you're asked to lunch or if they say we'd like for you to, you know, interact and socialize with the team, um, you drop your guard. And I, I don't know how you guys feel about that. I know my own opinion on that. Um, but what are your thoughts on you know, on getting pretty relaxed and pretty comfortable in an interview setting when you're going through the process and you have not yet been offered the job, what are some pitfalls to avoid or some things to, to be cognizant of as, as you're going through that? I'll, I'll share one tip that I gave my client yesterday. He was actually interviewing yesterday for a role in uh, New Mexico. And, and uh, we knew for a fact that one of the things that they would do is give him a tour and that they would walk him out to the exit when they were done. And I, you know, he wasn't a pro at interviewing, so I just said, look, when they're giving you the tour, the interview is still happening. And as they're walking down the hall chit-chatting, don't lower your guard. You're still interviewing. Everyone is watching you. And he was like, well, what are they going to ask? Well, it's impossible to anticipate every question in a hallway but you got to treat it as an interview. It's part of it. As a matter of fact, what I told them was the moment you pull into the parking lot until you actually drive out of the parking lot, you're still interviewing. Not that I believe that the employer was standing there with binoculars watching him, but you know, that's how you have to treat it is like you're always interviewing while you're on the premises. And it's very common for people to let their guard down when they're wandering the halls with, with the potential employer. Yep. Hey, Alan, our time is, uh, is pretty short, but just, I thought it would be important. Uh, I have a question to ask you guys, but, but in addition to that, we, did, we haven't talked about the importance of when you interview to ask questions and be prepared with at least two or three questions towards typically at the end of an interview, it's very common for them to ask you, do you have any questions? It would be a terrible mistake to say that I don't have any questions. And some of those questions might be things like, um, what would you, what's expected of, of the person that fills this role in the first 90 days? Something like that. But, but have some good questions, two or three really solid questions. And then, the, and then um, what I wanted to ask maybe the group to get their comments on is, is how do you end the interview? As, an, as a person being interviewed, right? How do you close the interview, if you will, right? What, what does that phrase look like? Is it a phrase that says something to the, the extent, what are the next steps? Can I ask what the next steps are? I'd like to hear, uh, maybe we'll ask Alan first since uh, we're, he's always asking us, we'll let Alan ask, answer that question. <laughs> how, do you, how, how do you close the interview when you're being interviewed, Alan? Yeah, so the, the way in which I always recommend people to uh, close the interview, again, is with a question. So I always say I see a lot of good things here uh, this, this opportunity sounds like an amazing opportunity and I would love to be a part of it. How do you see the fit? So what I try to do is I, I try to have uh, people who are interviewing separate themselves from their skill set. So people don't want to say, people will never say, well, I don't like you. But if you say, <laughs> how do you see the fit? 
they're going to say, well, I wish you had a little bit more of this particular skill set, or we didn't really get an opportunity to talk about this. And I wish, you know, maybe you had more of that to bring to the table. What it does is it really flushes out a lot of, you know, opportunity that may have been missed during the interview. When you say, how do you see the fit? And to me, it, you know, it's, it's worked magic uh, in the past because you're not going to leave. Like, you know, one of the things that I posted leading up to this was, have you, you know, have you ever left an interview thinking that you nailed it? Well, even the question that we asked, and then you find out that you didn't, that question really helps you understand where you stack up. You know, when you say, how do you see the fit again, not what do you think of me as a person, Alan, sitting here before you right now? Um, how do you see the fit is just a very, you know, it's a very different way to, to position that and a very different way to ask kind of the same question, um, but, but get them talking in, in ways of, you know, helping you understand what may have been missed along the way during the interview. You know, Alan, um, the little nugget there is that feedback that you get from that individual, if there's a next interview, um, you better believe that, that that individual has shared that with the next person interviewing. And now you've got a little piece of information that allows you to go deeper in the next interview on that particular yeah. topic. For sure. Anyone else have a, a way to, to wrap up that interview? We've got one more question here, but if you guys have any other, any other thoughts on how to wrap the interview. I'll add just one thing. I think, I think that your answer, Alan, is actually phenomenal. Um, what I've been teaching my clients is very similar. It's just slightly different wording. Yeah, it's just something like, you know, you, uh, there's a, there's Hollywood taught us the value of three, right? So I usually say, well, at least try to have three questions toward the end. And your last question should be your closed question. And typically what I, what I teach is, you know, say something along the fact of, um, you know, this has been great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about this opportunity. I just have one more question. Um, uh, what will be the next steps in the process? Because I would love to be a part of it. The point there is you express interest. Sometimes people interview so professionally that they forget to show interest. And that, that is the thing that I try to nudge people in. Is like, you got to express interest. Because over the years, I've had clients push back, uh, companies push back and say, we're not really sure if he wants the job. And then when you call the person, they're jumping up and down saying, what, what? Of course I want the job. Well, you didn't really express it. And it's almost like, well, was I supposed to? And it's like, yeah, you've been reading too many old school how to interview books from the East Coast from the 1970s. Throw those books out, you know? You gotta show interest too. So one more question uh, from, from the group. Uh, with a lot of roles on hold right now, what is the best way to balance following up versus being a nuisance? Yeah, may, uh, sorry, I'll just jump in on that. Yeah, I, I think uh, whatever, you, whatever you can do to be helpful and always approach it from a standpoint of, of helping. So, hey, what else would be helpful for you during the for you during this process? How else can I contribute? Uh, again, fundamentally, people hire other people to make their lives easier, right? And to come in and provide solutions. So if you can always set that expectation, or I see a lot of people uh, being the nuisance is when you're creating additional work for the people who you're trying to get status from. And so it could be like, hey, where are we at with this? Hey, have you talked to someone? You're just creating additional work and already, I mean, it could cause frustration with somebody. So just always approach it from a standpoint of, hey, what else can I provide to you? What else would be helpful for you? Approach it from that standpoint, you win a lot of friends. Very true. Excellent. Well, if, uh, if you all could put in the uh, comment section uh, or in the Q&A chat section, wherever some of the topics that you would like to hear about down the road. We already know what we're gonna talk about next week, which is uh, helping uh, graduates uh, navigate the waters of finding their first job upon graduation, uh, be they you know, a technical trade school or university or college or whatever. Um, there's certainly a, you know, a timely and appropriate way to, to make those connections and, and start to have those conversations. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. But for anything in the future that, that you all would like to talk about, please add it to the chat and, and we'll make sure to get it on the agenda. Uh, but we are grateful for 
uh, you all joining us today. We really appreciate it. And hopefully there was some value in attending. So everyone have a great day and thank you for being here. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you for hosting Alan.